Good morning and welcome back to the broadcast. It's Wednesday, April 18th, 2018. I'm Sean, your host, and the website is scriptureandprophecy.com. Today we're going to be continuing our study in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be looking at chapter 22, which begins with another parable, the parable of the wedding feast. Now in context, we need to remember who he's talking to. Uh, in chapter 21, we ended with a parable where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he tells them the parable of the vineyard owner and how, uh, you know, God sent, you know, it's, it's a metaphor, it's, a, it's symbolic for God sent his people, his prophets to them, but they rejected and killed them and then God sent his son and they still rejected and killed him. And as a result, the kingdom is being taken from them and given to another. And we talked about that last week. He immediately follows it up with this another with another parable. You have to remember, the scriptures the scriptures did not originally have uh, chapters and verses, and chapters and verses are extremely helpful. Um, but it's important to remember that sometimes the conversation is continuing. Um, so you know he ended with that parable, and it says that they wanted to kill him, but they couldn't. And then Jesus says, "Okay, I'm going to tell you another parable," and he tells him this parable that we're getting ready to read. It's the parable of the wedding feast, which is basically the saying the exact same thing he just said to the Jewish religious leaders, uh, but saying it in a different way. However, I don't want to focus in on that aspect because, like I said, Scripture has multiple layers, multiple fulfillments, and I believe this parable of the wedding feast uh, is a parable that's applicable, if I can say that word, uh, the application of it applies to us today in these last days. And if we're not careful, we might find ourselves in this parable, both Jew and Gentile alike, uh, as we are moving into these last days. And uh, I'm going to discuss what I want to focus in on uh, today, but I wanted to start by just saying, hey, it does have, you know, literal uh, application to what he was just talking to them about in the in the parable in, in chapter 21. It's just a continuation of that thought. However, we should be taking this to heart today because we are in this situation right now and we're seeing this amongst our brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, people of the world. So I'm going to uh, read that and we'll discuss it. Uh, real quick, I want to thank those of you who support this and make it possible. And uh, your support goes beyond making the podcast possible. It helps me and my family and helps support us. And I just really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, you can go to scriptureandprophecy.com. There's two ways. Uh, there's a simple PayPal or mail. Um, or you can become a Patreon subscriber. Uh, Patreon.com slash truthfed. And that also gets you early access to the Hebrew uh, uh, course and uh, I plan on recording the third video sometime in the next seven days or so, which will only be available to Patreon subscribers for the first two weeks. So uh, just wanted to share that with you and just want to thank you so much for your generosity. It's, it's far more than I deserve. So thank you so much. All right. Let's do what we came here to do. Let's dig into Matthew 22 and see if it speaks to our spirit. Let's begin. Matthew 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, which made a marriage feast for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, 
bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both good and bad, or both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. All right, now before we move on, we got to deal with this parable. And I already gave you kind of the background. You know, I told you about the parable of the that he just told to these same people. This is the same conversation we're looking at here. He just told them the parable of the vineyard. And I sent his people his, to, to tell them they killed them and they killed the son. And then he says, the kingdom's being taken from you, given to someone else. The Pharisees said that they perceived that he was talking about them. And they wanted to kill him, but they couldn't because of the crowds. Then Jesus goes on to say another parable. He's saying the exact same thing here. L I mean, look at it. He's bidden them to the wedding. He sent them the Messiah. They rejected him. Um, he sent they, he sent for servants, same as sending for prophets and messengers, but uh, telling them that you know the marriage is here. But they made light of it. They went their own way. Um, they didn't, they treated the servants spitefully. And the king was wroth about this, and then he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Now, if you remember, in 70 A.D., what happened? Romans came in, slaughtered millions of Jewish people. There was blood running through the streets. The temple was destroyed and torn down. But Jerusalem was burned. Okay, so it's there's that picture going on. However, and he says, go on the highways and you'll find, you know, it's, it's the picture of you go out and gather the Gentiles, you know, good and bad, you know, it's gathering those who are willing to come, right? Those who are willing to accept Messiah, they are brought in. Now, I'll deal with this guest who doesn't have a wedding garment in a minute. It's not complicated. It's just a picture, um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I really want to dial in on is, is we, as, as we take this parable and we apply it to these last days, and I believe... Like I said, scriptures have multiple layers, and I think this is speaking to us again today, because here's what's happening. We're moving into what appears to be the last days, right? The return of Messiah, once and for all, is near and at the door. And we tell people, and you can relate to this, we tell them, we say, hey, look, it's about time. You need to get your life ready. You need to prepare. You need to you need to draw near to God. You need to take your relationship with God seriously. You need to uh, come to Jesus, right? You need to have a come to Jesus moment and trust in him and start to follow him and take these things serious because it's about to unravel. Sometime in the very near future, it's about to unravel. Sometime in the very near future, Messiah is going to show up in the sky and you either know him or you don't. And what happens? exactly what happens here in verse 5 in a parable but they made light of it they went their own ways one to his farm another to his merchandise how many times does this happen we tell these things to people and they just make light of it oh well you know they've been saying that for thousands of years oh it's not the last days people have been predicting that forever everybody every generation thinks they're the last one um, or you'll get or you'll get a response similar. Maybe you've heard this response. Well, you know, I want Jesus to come back, but not yet because I got this thing I want to do, right? I'm just, you know, I'm, I want to, you know, I want to get married first. I want to have, you know, all these excuses why they can't focus and pay attention to this thing that's going on. And that's what it says. It says in verse 5, they made light of it. They went their own ways, one to his farm, one to his merchandise, you know. They're too occupied with the things of this world. Now, we all live here. You know, we all have things we have to do. We have jobs we have to go to. We have families we have to care for. We have things that we're passionate about. The question is, is are, are those things more important to you than your relationship with God? Are you making light of the warnings that are coming from God's people saying, get ready, prepare, repent, draw near to God? Are you making light of it? Because 
the day is coming, and we don't know when, but I suspect it's in our it's in this generation. And just like you know, this this parable can play out in our day, just as well as it played out in their day, two thousand years ago. Now, it says here when the came, when the when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there was a man there which had not a wedding garment, and he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said, The servants bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Here's the deal. It's just a picture of you're not entering into the kingdom. You're not entering into the wedding feast. You're not entering in without a wedding garment. And the garment itself is a picture of, of you know, it's, it, it's a picture that you are... Uh, in relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, it's that you're covered with that righteousness, his righteousness. He's the one that gives out the garments. Uh, let's take a moment and let's just see some. I, there's several options we could go to. I just want to point out a couple of options in Revelation where it talks about the garment. So if we go to Revelation chapter 6, the seals are, are happening. And if you go to verse 9, it says, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them which were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So these people have been killed for their faith. And he cried, and, they, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were were fulfilled it's just it's a picture of them being given garments right if you go to uh, revelation chapter 7 you'll see another garment being handed out you've got the 144,000 um, and then you've got this multitude that nobody can number all right this is when everybody is gathered to, this is when god gathers all of his people from the earth right after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number of all nations, and all kindreds, and peoples, and tongues. Notice it's not divided by bloodline. It's people from all over the planet, all different bloods, all different peoples, all different tongues. Stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hand. And so, you know, this garment just like the wedding garment it's it's just a, it's a picture of righteousness it's a picture of being covered uh you know and how and how are you covered you're covered through faith in Christ very very simple but i think sometimes people and i've been guilty of overcomplicating that uh in the past all right we've spent 13 minutes just talking about this parable let's move on and finish the uh, chapter 22. We could spend a lot more time talking about this. I've actually done entire podcasts where I talk about the last days and I incorporate the parable of the wedding feast and the parable of the wise virgins and, and all of that. So you can find those uh, in the archives. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees then went the Pharisees and took counsel on how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth, and neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? In other words, they're asking, should they, have to pay, should they pay their taxes? Verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness, and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they went, brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Who is the image and the superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their own way. The same day came him the Sadducees, which say that there is no, resurre no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. 
Now there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife to his, unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third, and unto the seventh. And the last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto him, Ye do, ye do error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which is spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. And, you know, so you have the Sadducees, which was a sect of religious leaders who did not believe in the resurrection. And so they're trying to entangle him with this question, saying, whose wife is it going to be if she's been married seven times? Jesus says, it's not like that in the kingdom of heaven. People will be like the angels in that they will not marry or be given in marriage. And uh, so... That seems to be the case. You know, according to Jesus, uh, we will not be married in, in heaven. And uh, I have to be honest, I find that kind of disappointing. But I'm sure that when I see the way things are set up, um, you know, I will definitely rejoice and agree with the way God has designed his kingdom. Uh, but in the flesh, you know, I, I, I find it disappointing that there won't be, you know, those kind of relationships uh, in the kingdom. Uh, but like I said, you know, I'm sure that I'm wrong, right? <laughs> Obviously. All right, moving forward. Uh, verse 34. When the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, here's what some people try to say. Some people try to say that Jesus says there's only two commandments now. Love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, all of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's very, very simple, folks. If I'm loving my neighbor, I'm not going to steal from him. I'm not going to kill, kill him. I'm not going to covet his wife. I'm not going to bear false witness against him. Do you see? It's very, very simple. It's not that suddenly all these things are no longer part of the law or part or considered sin. It's that if you're doing the first two things, you're loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you'll automatically be doing the rest of the commandments and the law and of the prophets. Because, you know, all of those, in order to do all those things, you have to be doing the first two, which is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's not complicated. But it does not mean that, oh, because what our culture has done is we say, oh, well, I'm being loving, and that's all that matters. I can still look at pornography. I can still do all these other evil things because at least I'm being loving to my neighbor. And, 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 I'm, and I'm like, no, that's not what it's saying. And if you're disobeying all those other things, you're not loving God. It's not complicated. This is the Christian walk, and I know that it's been tainted uh, by modern society and other movements uh, that suggest that there's no longer th that there's no longer any standard on how and morale and how you are to walk but that's not true following Jesus will cost you something let's finish it off here verse 41 while the pharisees were gathered together Jesus asked him saying what think you of Christ whose son is he they in other words he's saying what do you think of the messiah Whose son is the Messiah? And they said unto him, The son of David. And he saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on thy right hand till I make thy enemies a footstool? If, if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? 
and no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. And that is the end of chapter 22 in the Gospel of Matthew. You know, real quick, you know, we were talking about how um, in this in this parable, the wedding feast, how you tell people about Jesus, you tell them that the days are coming, that the days are near, that we're in the last days, we, that you need to get right, and, and just like the parable says, they made light of it, they went their own ways, and what did they do? They went to their possession, to their things, right? It says they went their own ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And I just want to say to those of you who your faith has cost you something, Maybe it's cost you friendships. Maybe it's cost you, you know, relationships within your own family. Um, maybe it's cost you possessions. Maybe it's cost you job opportunities. You know, let's let's be encouraged and remember that just a couple of chapters ago, Jesus said this to his disciples, and he said, "And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren." or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, meaning possessions and things, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. You know, our faith is going to cost us something in this world, in this life. And things aren't going to be convenient. You're going to have spiritual warfare. You're going to have warfare from... Uh, your employers and from your family. But the reward is a hundredfold in the kingdom. And that's nothing compared to inheriting everlasting life. Well, I hope the podcast blessed you this morning. And if it did, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, thank you again for your support and uh, making this possible. Uh, I just can't think of anything more important to do in these last days than to study God's word and to share the good news uh, with as many people as we can, which is that you know Christ died, and then God rose him from the dead, and he paid for our sins. And if people put their faith in that, if they would just believe and follow after him, and you could be saved. Because this world is going to burn, and the goat and the sheep are going to be separated very, very soon. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until the next time, God bless.